this, um, are working more and more in terms of integrating uh, language models into the control stack um, of, of, these, of these quantum simulators. Uh, so I wanted to point out contributions, particularly by uh, perimeter postdoc Juan Kereskija, who is now moving to ETH Zurich uh, in a faculty position for um, basically computational uh, condensed matter physics. And a, a, a student that we jointly advise, Mohamed Ibn Allah, who was the first one who adopted kind of language models into this field uh, for us in a, in a large scale sense. So, <clears throat> very, very briefly, um, I'll, I want to define just a little bit what I'm talking about when I mention language models, in case there's any machine learning novices in the crowd, and then applications to simulation and then. I thought, you know, it's appropriate for ICANN that we end on a discussion of emergence. I was thinking of a couple emergent related topics in the panel discussion, but I've saved them. So if we have time, maybe we could wax <laughs> philosophical on that. Um, GPT, I mean, it's been a year, and I would argue that we're really in the age of generative models in artificial intelligence. Um, they've done remarkable things for, you know, science and society, and we'll, there's no, you know, you can't get rid of generative models now. The Pandora's box is open, right? Um, the models are actually relatively small. So if you train GPT-4, it has, you know, has a fairly large number of parameters, which I'll show in some sense, but it's small enough that you could basically take the trained model, put it on a USB stick, and pass it out, I don't know, at a, at a conference. So, you know, it's these, these models are here to stay. Uh, just to kind of, I guess, ground us in what I mean when I talk about language models and generative models and all that stuff. Just a very simple uh, sort of classification. So I'm making a distinction between discriminative AI, which is like ImageNet like we talked about. If you have an image of a cat or a dog and you want to dis you know, discriminate between them, that's kind of one. They're, they're all related, but that's kind of one task. I really want to talk about generative models where I would generate new pictures of cats and dogs. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about it. And within the, the space of generative models, there's all sorts of different architectures and different strategies and so on. And since we, uh, since Pankish men mentioned off-field <laughs> networks, I just wanted to make one distinction between two types of uh, generative models, one that's energy-based and one that's what I'm going to call autoregressive, which is based on the language models. Energy-based models, you know, are, are bread and butter for physicists in some sense. The, the whole point of a generative model is to model a likelihood or a probability distribution, to learn a distribution from data. And in most energy-based models, or maybe all energy-based models, uh, you can imagine you have some energy function, which is a bunch of weights and biases in the neural network, uh, which parameterize that distribution. But you don't know the partition function. So it's unnormalized. There's this intractable Z, Z that's hanging around, and so on. In an autoregressive model, that's not true. Autoregressive models are constructed based on sequences, which I'll talk a lot about. Uh, and you know, basically, it's a joint distribution that's broken in uh, to a product of conditionals through what we call the chain, you know, the chain rule of probabilities. And that sequence modeling is really important for autoregressive, uh, you know, for language models, sorry, because languages are very naturally sequential. Uh, so here's a prompt I put into GPT-3, hickory dickory dock, the mouse, and then everything in green has been generated. So it's a good example of kind of this autoregressive structure. Each one of these words ran up the clock, up the clock. You know, it, it diverges from the poem, you know, so it's hallucinating. Uh, but each one of these words is selected as a conditional distribution based on all the words previous to it. Okay? So that's a typical generative setting uh, for an autoregressive model. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the point is that this is the, you know, the resulting distribution is normalized. There's no partition function in there. It's kind of a great way of grounding your thinking on autoregressive models for statistical physicists. And recurrent neural networks, transformers, GPT, they're all based on this autoregressive structure. And you know, they've become much more sophisticated than hickory dickory dock. I like this, this is from the, well, it got cut off, but this is the GPT-4 paper. Uh, blue is GPT 3.5, I guess, and green is GPT 4. You see a huge, I'm going to use the word now, emergence in accuracy between these two versions of GPT uh, for a whole bunch of standard tests. Uh, you know, this is the, the score on the test. Where's AP physics? I don't know where it is. It's remarkable. This 
GPT-4 is doing much better than I would do on like, obviously US history, uh, writing and so on. And in fact, it looks like based on these scores, GPT-4 would get into, you know, Harvard Law or something like that. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's remarkable. There's, there's no doubt about it. <clears throat> Generative models, you know, the basic setting is that you have data. So we're talking about these huge data sets that go into training, you know, the GPT, whatever version. And so the black box in that case is the internet and the probability distribution that you're trying to model is the probability of all words or sentences or everything, you know, everything that's on the internet. What's the probability of the internet having this? But you can imagine a more simple case where that probability distribution is, uh, you know, again, just all simple words or what I'm going to imagine doing is turning that into a quantum wave function. So imagine I have maybe a born distributed you know, probability distribution that comes from measurements, projected measurements in a wave function. Uh, what that black box does is produce data vectors that you use in training. And so it's either, you know, words I'm selecting from a dictionary, but I only have a dictionary of two items here, one and zero. And the length of the sentence could be the number of qubits in your device. So I'm starting to make this map between, you know, languages and, and qubits. Once you get enough data vectors, you know, the goal of generative modeling, number one is to define a model. You think of a neural network, but really what you're doing is parameterizing that probability distribution. And then you're adjusting all the weights and biases, all those parameters, so that the model and the black box distribution are as close as possible. And you can define some loss function, like a KL divergence. Uh, and then basically all optimization is done through some version of gradient descent in these things. So these are just massive gradient descent machines. And so that's kind of the density estimation setting. And the typical setting is you have data, but <coughs> you can also, for physics applications, imagine a loss function that doesn't depend on data, but somehow depends on the microscopic interactions in your system or a target Hamiltonian or something like that, okay? So you can take, you know, the beauty of modern generative models is you can use them as for what they've intended for, but you can also, um, you know, train them variationally and, and, and call them variational wave functions. And so I think that's one of the amazing things that's going on in our field right now. I'm going to fly through a little bit more of, uh, you know, a few more slides, just making this. Can you comment on generalization <laughs> and like the distinction? You know, I, I've had this comment. Like, what is generalization? Yeah, what is generalization? Like, I mean, but it's, it's true in all variational ansatz too, right? Like, you minimize the energy. How do you know you're getting all the other? correlation functions straight. And I just feel like as these models get more expressive, you're more and more in danger of something like that. And and like... So one answer to that and is... And I feel like that making that change is not so innocuous when you... This is a huge it. difference. So yeah. I actually took a lot of the details out of my talk, but I feel when you do a variational optimization, you're biasing your optimization procedure to, uh, to get the best energy, yes. which could be at the cost of correlation functions. So if I have... You know, that, that's one setting. If I have a black box, say a quantum computer that produces the state of interest, that's a very, very, very different optimization problem. And so you'll tend to get the correlations more correct if you're, if you're training from data. With the caveat that you have the ground truth stuck somewhere in the quantum computer. So these are incredibly different. Yeah, I totally agree. And one beauty of the modern generative models is you can swap between these two cost functions. But yeah, so the intuition of this gets you a good energy and bad correlation functions, you know, in part can be rectified if you feed a limited data set into these models and, and have some sort of schedule of going swapping between these two. So you deliberately, I think, put in a quantum computer in your black box. And presumably the quantum computer is described by probability amplitudes. And, right. and we know that if we try to model those using Monte Carlo, we end up getting negative probabilities and things like that, which are completely right. absent from your, from your model, your right. generative model. So They're on the next, next, next slide. So, so that would be a deficiency, presumably, of the model. No, you can parameterize the phase, essentially no problem, into any modern generative model. Mm -hmm. And you can parameterize the density matrix and, you can, and any, any structure you want. What you then need <coughs> is measurements in all sorts of different bases. Mm -hmm. So this type of loss function gets tied into like a tomography problem, if you want to perform quantum state tomography. Mm -hmm. So there is no sign problem in either of these. That's another way of thinking about it. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Um, let's keep it rolling. So 
I want to make a point about autoregressive models being efficient. <laughs> and it's largely just a, 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 you know, an empirical observation that these models are uh, very good for physics applications. How do I map between, maybe this is obvious and I said it, but how do I map between uh, you know, language models and qubit sequences? It's really just by limiting the size of the dictionary. Here is a really basic generative model in green, could be an RNN or a transformer. You know, here's my dictionary of a number of words. I guess there's like seven there. Really what's happening is you select X1, which is hickory, put that into the model. There's some sort of weights and biases that you've trained. And then the conditional probability of the next, uh, you know, word in the sequence is sampled. And that sample is fed into the model and so on. And so if I had a, a you know, Google's quantum computer that was producing projective measurements, I could essentially break it down in the same way and just imagine getting all of the conditional distributions out you know, from the samples, it can predict elements in the sequence, and then combining those things to get a normalized, get a normalized wave function out. So the joint distribution is normalized in these models, and that's one hypothesis about why uh, you know, GPT and all of these autoregressive models are so powerful. Um, generated samples are uncorrelated, so there's no Markov chain anymore. There's no Mar Monte Carlo sampling. There's no autocorrelation time. And that, that makes a big difference in things like variational optimization, where here you would have to produce a whole bunch of samples in training in order to get the variational loss function. Now that can be done very efficiently with autoregressive models. Um, I'm gonna fly through this. Uh, here's a recurrent neural network. This is the first autoregressive models we used for applications in quantum simulation. And it's just a, for sake of completeness, that just to show you how the parameterization works. These look very different than restricted Boltzmann machines or hot field networks or energy-based models because all of the weights and biases that you're learning or training are kind of hidden in this RNN recurrent cell. And so it's just, sorry, this should be X. So if I have a qubit state that I put into this recurrent cell, in an RNN, I'm also passing a hidden vector that has an appropriate size such that, you know, there's a nonlinear function inside this RNN uh, that has weights here and biases that are learned. Okay, so those are part of the optimization procedure. Uh, the output of the recurrent cell, uh, which is this new hidden vector, that's why I guess it's recurrent, you know, so if I had sigma one or X one going in, I would output H two. That can be manipulated like through a soft max to get these conditional distributions. Those conditional distributions can be sampled and so on. And like I said, it appears there's no problem parameterizing amplitudes and phases. So phases just have here, I have a soft sign, but there's, there's you know, as many different parameterizations of a phase as there are, I don't know. Sorry, can you, can you, can you <laughs> I, I don't quite understand the vertical structure. Okay, so the output of the recurrent cell is just a hidden vector. Yeah. It's passed into the next iteration. Right. But then it's also manipulated here into S, which is a soft max, which gives you a normalized, it's, it gives you a normalized output, which is the normalized conditional distribution. So it's used in two different ways. So kind of this is the sequence, and then this is some other manipulations of the hidden, you know, the hidden units passed into these functions and then sample. But really, the, the autoregressive sequence goes this way. Right. Roger, can I ask a question? How do these things deal well with, with deal with symmetries? Like, like the translational symmetry you've broken. I can put in a U1 symmetry in here, no problem. So we do we put symmetries in these things. So you just hardwire them. You basically hardwire them. They, you know, they come to you from industry with no, I don't know, basically like blank slates, and you can do all sorts of stuff. So U1 is a big symmetry that's easy to put in. I understand uh, that, translation. But... It gets a little trickier in the transformer. So all GPT, all, you know, they're all based on, I'm not gonna go through it, the transformer architecture. I'll show you a couple more points with the transformer. But one, one thing to note in the transformer, and I've really only been showing the right-hand side of things where, okay, I mean, it, it, it's not, not even gonna make a connection, but the fact that showed this already. Uh, you basically have what we call masked multi-headed attention. So a, a, an attention layer in a transformer as a direct mapping to a Jastrow, uh, you know, basically factor in a variational wave function. So what it is, is it's encoding all two point correlations explicitly in it. Whereas in an RNN, you're passing hidden vectors and as you get, you know, 4,000 spins away from H1, you start to, those correlations start to degrade. So the, again, just trying to tie physics into machine learning. 
Uh, why are these architectures so powerful? One hypothesis is that they have an explicit, uh, you know, encoding of all two uh, two body correlations directly in the attention layer. Um, but and the basis of mono, yeah, basis of LLM. So large language models are based off these. These have demonstrated emergence, and we debated this a bit. Was it yesterday? Um, but I looked up the paper that I'm always thinking about: emergent abilities of large language models from 2022. The point of emergence in these types of models is once they grow in sufficient size, so that's enough parameters and enough training data and been trained long enough. And here's, you know, here's model scale, they call it on the x-axis. So that's floating point numbers. So how many floating point numbers have been pushed into these models? Uh, here's you know, modular arithmetic, some other uh, you know, tasks, and here's different models, including GPT-3 and Lambda. You know, they see an abrupt jump in the accuracy uh, as a function of, of the number of floating point numbers that have been pushed through these things. And this is what machine learn, learning people call emergence. So I don't have time for anything else in this talk. I think the point is that, that one of the points I'd like to make is that these models have now demonstrated some form of scaling and emergence. You know, GPT-4 is a trillion parameters. So think of a variational wave function with a trillion parameters. And uh, I don't know how many tokens were pushed through it. Uh, I should know that number, uh, but you know the scale is comparable to this, and because that many floating point numbers have gone through it, it costs $100 million to train. So this ties to the point that you know only industry can afford $100 million to train these things. But if we had $100 million, we could have a great variational wave function. So that's my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to fly through a bunch of applications now, and just stop me if you see anything you like. Uh, in, in the next five minutes, or we can discuss things after. So this is what we're doing with, with these language models. Okay? First off, if you have a time sequence, if you have data that's a time sequence, like qubit data, and you know, I kind of showed the one and zero example, but you could have all sorts of real numbers. These things are great at prediction. So I mentioned you know, using AI in the control stack for quantum computers. This is already a reality. Here is uh, a control algorithm that we wrote for a trapped ion quantum computer at Waterloo, run by Rajul Islam and Crystal Sanko. Here's a rabbi flop you know, of a single uh, ytterbium ion in the trap. You know, we have some training time, and then we have some prediction time, and I have, it's only one qubit, so I can fully, you know, whatever, sh figure out the exact time evolution. Uh, and, you know, you can see that you get perfect. Correspondence. So what you've done here is you've unrolled, in this case, an R and N. You have, each one of these blue dots is one recurrent cell along the time sequence. And you can just imagine, you know, if you can do this type of prediction uh, in silico, you speed up your, your, your clock speed of your quantum computer gets faster because, you know, whatever you need to know out here at long times can be predicted by short time behavior. That's a real simple example, I think. And it's, it's, we routinely use uh, language models for this type of control. Here's another example, variational ground state. So I mentioned you can train these things variationally. Regime and I had a, talk, a discussion yesterday about whether this beats state-of-the-art methods like tensor networks. And the answer is yes, these variational wave functions have trained off of uh, you know, an interacting, uh, strongly correlated Hamiltonian. Like here's, the, uh, here's an L by L triangular lattice Heisenberg model, which has a famous sign problem. Uh, there's no sign problem in the variational formulation of VMC. Uh, here's RNNs, so here's the language model minus the DMRG energy. So the DMRG wins, wins, wins until I get the 12 by 12, and then I get the lowest energy from the uh, language model. So we, I don't know what the, the correlation function, but there's no, there's no surprises in this model. You, you know what the ground state is. Um, yeah, you know, it's got some symmetry breaking state. But just to point out that these things make great variational wave functions, and they're relatively efficient uh, out here on the large you know, L by L sizes, they're only using 0.1% of the number of parameters of the DMRG. And I forget the actual total number. But again, the hope is that if we scale these things, you know, they will, you know, they will. Sorry, what, what do you mean by the parameters of DMRG here? Uh, you know, the bond dimension is, you increase the bond dimension, and that's how you increase the number of parameters. In, you know, so the, the tensor network is, is really another autoregressive uh, model. It's just another way of parametrizing a wave function. Can I, can I ask a question? Have you tried to estimate things like entanglement by using mutual information between your soft maps and seeing how well it does? Between our what? 
Well, you have you have whatever between your conditional probabilities, right? Regional information again. Does, 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 does that correlate well with entanglement in these in your variation lines? Are you talking about like if I divide yeah. the system into region yeah. A and B? And, yeah. Yeah. I mean that's a. Uh, so, so I'm just wondering how well it estimates things like entanglement. Yeah. Great. I mean it's a function of training, but we routinely use. Okay, let me show you another example. Uh, here, here's from the other program. So. Um, so we, I, I get a lot of data from Misha Lukin's group who uh, builds, this is basically a transfer fieldizing model. Uh, so there's no sign problem. So I have Quantum Monte Carlo that works for this. But we get a lot of data from his experiment and his data looks like this. It's just projected measurements, zeros and ones of, of the qubit uh, states essentially. Um, so there's a special, because there's no sign structure in this Hamiltonian, if I, learn a language model from this data, it's the full representation of the wave function. And then I can do any trick I want in terms of measuring things in different bases. So here's not directly your question, but again, assuming that this is the form of, of the wave function, uh, I can do things, you know, now, now that I have a parameterized, sorry, I called this theta before, but I have a parameterized version of this wave function. I can do tricks that we do from variational Monte Carlo, for example, the local estimator which basically just lets me measure off diagonal uh, um, estimators or, or expectations. Yeah, yeah. So you could, I, I'm just asking because with energy based models, you can do this stuff too. But with recurrent yes, neural networks, what you can calculate is entanglement, which I don't see how you can do from energy based models very easily. Or maybe you can Second add. Rainy entropies. Second, third, fourth Rainy okay. entropies. So I don't have the estimator here, but there's yeah, a way to do it with, with the nth moment of trace rho to the end. Okay, I get it. So I was going to, yeah. I, in a, in a more physics-y talk, I would show that. So we actually give entanglement entropies back to, say, Misha when he gives us his data. And so it's, it's incredibly useful. They say, the experimentalists say it's useful. Uh, one more example. So that, this is actually an old work from 2019 when we were using an energy-based model. Because actually, here, the partition function is canceled out. Uh, but now these things scale much better with language models. And so just to go back to Rydberg, uh, atoms uh, and you know GPTs and transformers. This is the new architecture that we're basically building for the experimentalists. And it has the typical structure of a prompt, a prompt that goes into an encoder. And I just use a prompt that's a Hamiltonian. You just take your Hamiltonian, you have a certain number of parameters in there. I prompt my model. And then for every prompt, I train it with, you know, here's my autoregressive path through a two dimensional atomic system, uh, which is basically a one projective measurement. Once the thing's trained, um, I can literally just prompt that model and vary the parameters of the Hamiltonian. And here's an example for my students that shows how it works. Here's just the energy of a, of a 200, uh, what size is this? I think it's a 16 by 16, so 256 um, atom quantum device. It's been trained on the arrows. So there's some phase transition we were looking at here and so on. Uh, I have the exact answer for the energy from my quantum Monte Carlo, but the blue, is the result of uh, the GPT model uh, once prompted with different uh, Hamiltonian parameters. So you can see it's basically perfect along this line. And what it tells you is that, again, it's about AI lowering the cost of prediction. I can predict what's gonna happen in you know, my experimental system. I can, you know, this can be experimental data that I train on. And I can use this thing to predict that what happened in regions where I haven't tuned the experiment yet. So I think these architectures, these language models are super flexible. Uh, and allow for all sorts of integration back and forth uh, with experiment. Error correction is another one. Google, Google uses this for error correction, right? But anyway, so it's, it's all these things are, um, I'd say, being implemented in, in, as we speak. And so I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about my discussion points, but maybe a question before that. So my just, you know, language models are here. We're training them all the time. They're, they can be trained variationally, and they be, can be trained with data or any combination thereof, which I think is super interesting. Um, you know, you can ask about digital twins. You think about quantum advantage. You know, you build, Google builds a machine that can't be simulated, uh, but if you have data from that machine, is it possible to learn the state of the computer in one of these language models with data? Why not? We still don't really know how that scales, how the learning problem scales uh, when you use the uh, data-driven cost function. 
So they're powerful simulation tools, I argue, and they're only getting better and better every year uh, that we work on them. What's still hard about it? It's the optimization. You know, when we have that loss function, we have all that data, you know, where's, where's the sign problem go? Where's the hard problem? It's somehow in that optimization. So what language models are is very good, you know, heuristic tools for optimization. And so those heuristics seem to serve us very well, I would say, but they're still based on gradient descent. Um, and just to, you know, get back to that point about emergence, we know that these language models scale. We know that they have emergent properties. And those are also the goals of quantum simulation, either, you know, numerically in silico, or if we build a quantum computer, we want to see emergent phenomena when we get enough qubits together or when we get a big enough simulation structure. Uh, so I think it's really interesting now because what we're actively doing, and again, this is happening in real time, is we're taking quantum data, we're learning language models, and then we're doing things like this, which is predicting you know, the outcome of the quantum, or the output of the quantum computer in different regions. And you can either interpolate within distribution, which, or, or you can interpolate out of distribution, which is like this stuff here. And so both of these things are going, you know, both these paths in distribution and out of distribution are being used, you know, both in design and so on, but also in active feedback uh, with the quantum computer. So it, it kind of begs this question, like if we, you know, if we don't know what the AI is doing, <laughs> do we really have full control of the quantum computer? And if we observe emergent phenomenon, in a device that was built with an emergent, you know, complex AI system. Again, have we, have we really achieved anything? Those are my philosophical points. Thank you for listening. <laughs> we have several questions. We have the talk for one more. Yeah, so. You mentioned that you can code the phase and you have no minus sign problems in your encoding. But if I run that back against you, does that mean that I can completely reformulate quantum mechanics in terms of probabilities yes. and dump amplitudes altogether? I think so. Why not? Yeah. So, I mean, you can encode all the entanglement. So, one of the general models we have is a POVM version. So you have measurements along different bases or different axes, and then that's fine, kind of all the phase is encoded there, and all the entanglement is encoded in the classical generative model. I think, I think there's no, nothing stopping. I think Ohm would be very delighted to hear your answer. <laughs> <laughs> very practical. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks Absolutely. Again. Our last speaker today. Uh, There's something missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like a bell in the quality. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. Uh, no, it's just a plain uncertainty principle. I don't understand it. You have to explain it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.